Luke presents the Lord Jesus as the perfect man while writing to Greek-speaking Gentiles. He emphasises the prayers of Jesus, recording eight specific prayers throughout his ministry. Along with several miracles recorded by other Gospel writers, he records seven that are not recorded by the others. Six of these are healing miracles, which should be no surprise with Luke being a doctor, and he would therefore take a keen interest in healings. He also recorded many of the parables, and is the only writer to record some of the best-known stories, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, and the Pharisee and the Tax Collector. Luke also places a great emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist and Jesus' parents are recorded as being filled with the Holy Spirit, and Simeon is a man of the Spirit. Luke tells us that Jesus is conceived by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and baptised others with the Spirit. Jesus teaches that the Father gives the Spirit. He warns of blasphemy against the Spirit. He promises that the Spirit will instruct the disciples, and after his resurrection, he promises that the Spirit will come to help the disciples. In the opening chapters of the Gospel, Luke relates a number of stories having to do with the birth and childhood of Jesus, including the announcements made to Zechariah and to Mary concerning the births of John and Jesus and the story of the shepherds watching their flocks at night, who come to worship the newborn child. After eight days, the doctor records that the child was circumcised, and later he was blessed by both Simeon and by Anna. These stories are not reported in the other Gospels. Luke includes a considerable number of Jesus' teachings that are not recorded in the other Gospels. Throughout his Gospel, Luke emphasises the fact that Jesus was a friend not only to the Jews, but to Samaritans and to so-called outcasts from different races and nationalities. Luke is the only New Testament writer who is not a Jew, and the account was written primarily for Gentiles. Luke is also a champion of women. In Palestine, the place of women was very low. But Luke gives special place to women. He writes of Mary, Elizabeth, Anna, the widow of Nain, the woman who anointed Jesus' feet, Mary and Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Interestingly, Luke is also the gospel of praise. The phrase praising God occurs more often than in the rest of the New Testament put together. Luke, as we know, was not a disciple but he stresses that he received information from eyewitnesses, emphasising how careful he was to get accurate information. Luke is saying, read what I have written, and you will see the facts on which Christianity is based, and you will find there something firm and solid and absolutely trustworthy, a sure foundation for faith. Luke then introduces Zechariah and Elizabeth, a godly couple who were deeply saddened that they were unable to have children, a situation which is seemingly hopeless. Zechariah was faithful to keep serving in the temple. The angel said, your prayer has been heard. So often when our troubles extend into years and our hardships seem to never end, we can be tempted to stop praying. But keep on praying, because your prayers are being heard. Zechariah was serving in the temple when the angel Gabriel came to tell him that they were going to have a son. Zechariah was rather sceptical, because both he and his wife were too old. Because he questioned the angel, Zechariah was unable to speak until the day his son was born. The angel Gabriel also appears to Mary, telling her that she will bear a son called Jesus, who will be called the Son of the Highest. Mary visits Elizabeth, and the as-yet-unborn John leaps in his mother's womb. Gabriel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon her. 
Mary's song magnifies the Lord, praising him for pulling down the mighty from their thrones and exalting the lowly. Just as Gabriel promised, Zechariah and Elizabeth had a son who they named John. Elizabeth recognises God's tender grace, saying, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favour and taken away my disgrace among the people. When John was born, Zechariah was able to speak again, and immediately he starts praising God. Zechariah prophesies that his son will be called the prophet of the highest, and go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Caesar Augustus, also known as Octavian, originally called Gaius Octavius, was the first Roman emperor. His mother's uncle was Julius Caesar, and he was named in Caesar's will as his adopted son and heir. He declares that there should be a census. Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem, but there's no room in the inn. So they are offered space in the lower room, the place where the animals are usually kept. It was here that the saviour of the world is born, and laid in an animal feeding trough. Following the birth, angels appear to some shepherds on a hillside, some of the lowest and most despised in society. The shepherds visit the child and spread the word about him. Luke tells us that they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. Mary pondered about everything that had happened and treasured them up. She committed them to her memory. She was a woman who thought deeply about what was happening in her life. We too have to make time for waiting before God. Jesus is circumcised and presented in the temple after eight days. The eight days pause is due to Mary's ceremonial uncleanness. The godly Simeon says he can now depart in peace, having seen the Lord's salvation. Anna, an old prophetess, gives thanks to the Lord. Mary and Joseph return to Nazareth. Many years later, Jesus goes missing on one Passover in Jerusalem. Still a young man, he is eventually found in the temple, teaching and learning. Questioned by his parents, he says that they should have known he would be about his father's business. Following the death of Caesar Augustus, he is replaced as Caesar by his stepson, adopted son and former son-in-law, Tiberius Caesar. About 14 years later, we see John preaching a message of repentance all over the country around the River Jordan and starting a ministry of baptism using a quotation from Isaiah, Prepare the way of the Lord. John warns that claiming to be an ancestor of Abraham is no guarantee of salvation. John baptises with water, but he tells of one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. John is baptized, uh, Jesus is baptised by John, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. A voice from heaven declares, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Jesus is then led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God... However, the Greek is ambiguous here. It may well read, If you are the Son of God. It could equally well be translated since you are the Son of God. The temptations are to turn stone into bread, to command kingdoms, and to throw himself from the temple, or to put it another way, to look after number one, to get what you want the easy way without working, and to take a risk with God. In each case, Jesus refused to fall for the temptation, answering the devil by quoting Old Testament scripture. Although Jesus refused to turn stones into bread, he does feed the hungry. Although he refused political power, 
The proclamation of God's empire of justice and peace is the focus of his preaching and teaching. Although he refused to jump off the temple to see if God would send angels to catch him, he goes to the cross in confidence that God's will for life will triumph over the world's decision to execute him. Jesus returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. In the synagogue there, he emphasises preaching the gospel to the poor and proclaiming freedom to the captives and the oppressed. In Jesus' inaugural public address, he declares, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today is an important word for Luke. It occurs 12 times in his gospel. It is in such familiar passages as Today in the town of David a saviour has been born to you and Today you will be with me in paradise. For Luke, today is a moment of radical change. Yesterday can look glorious. Tomorrow can look glamorous. But today is so ordinary. So many of us get into a routine. Today is just another day. No, says Luke, today is an extraordinary day. God is with us today. Facing increasing opposition, Jesus says that no prophet is accepted in his own country. He walks through a murderous mob who seek to throw him off a hill. Jesus tours through Galilee, resisting the call to stay in one place. He casts out an unclean spirit in Capernaum and then heals Peter's mother-in-law. Many others who are sick and demon-possessed are cured. Jesus teaches from a boat at Gennesaret. The boat in question is actually Simon Peter's fishing boat, the one in which he and his brother Andrew had been fishing all night, albeit totally unsuccessfully, a fact that Peter immediately admits to the Lord. After teaching the crowds from the boat, Jesus told Peter to go out a little deeper to get a catch of fish. Proverbs 28 tells us, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. This is the point at which Peter confesses to his fruitless night's work, but says they will do what Jesus says. Such a lovely phrase there, but because you say so, Lord. They caught so many fish their nets were breaking, and they had to call James and John to come with their boat to help out. Even there, there were so many fish that both boats were full to the point of sinking. Peter fell down and worshipped Jesus, and Jesus told him he would become a fisherman, no longer catching fish, but fishing for people. Peter, Andrew, James and John immediately pulled their boats ashore, left everything and followed Jesus. They had fished all night and caught nothing. Now they have caught more fish than they have ever caught in their lives, but suddenly it doesn't matter anymore. They were following Jesus. Luke then records several incidences that we have already covered from the accounts of Matthew and Mark. The healing of a leper. The healing of the paralytic let down through the roof by his friends the calling of Matthew Levi, and Jesus eating at Matthew's sinful friends. Jesus being the Lord of the Sabbath. It is at this point in the narrative that Jesus spends the whole night in prayer to his father, after which he selects twelve men to be his special chosen disciples. There are two Simons, Peter and the Zealot, along with Simon Peter's brother. There are two Jameses, the son of Zebedee and the son of Alphaeus, with James the son of Zebedee's brother, John. There are two Judases, Iscariot and the son of James. And there's also Philip, Matthew, Bartholomew and Thomas. Jesus then takes his disciples out onto a plain where a vast crowd had gathered to be healed and listen to his teaching. 
He begins his Sermon on the Plain, much as he started the Sermon on the Mount, with some Beatitudes. The first, however, brings a stark contrast between the two. On the mountain he had prayed, Blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning those who are humble before God. Here on the plain he simply declares, Blessed are the poor, those who are struggling in social or financial terms. In contrast to those who are blessed, Jesus declares those to whom woe is declared, the rich, the well-fed, those who laugh, and those to whom all men speak well. I should emphasise that none of these things are sinful. It's to do with attitude and priorities. Jesus then said, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Do to others as you would have them do to you. It sounds excellent in theory, but so difficult to do in practice. But nevertheless, this is what we are instructed to do. Jesus then said, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. Before explaining the application, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus then said the very challenging statement, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This led to the well-known parable of the wise and foolish builders, who built houses on rock and sand respectively, indicating the vital importance of building our lives on the solid foundation of the Gospel of the Lord. Once again we have a lengthy section of events which have already been covered in the Gospels of Matthew or Mark. John the Baptist's disciples questioning Jesus, a sinful woman washing Jesus' feet, both with her tears and some expensive perfume, before Jesus forgives her sin. He then teaches the parable of the sower, before sleeping on a boat in a storm, when he gets up and calms the storm. He heals legion of his demons, and legion goes on to testify in his neighbourhood of the miracle that Jesus has brought. A woman is healed of her hemorrhage by touching Jesus' garment. Jairus' daughter is brought back from the dead. Jesus gives his disciples authority over demons and sends them out to heal people and proclaim the kingdom. They are told to take very little with them, depending on local hospitality. If a city is not receptive, then they are to leave, shaking the dust from their feet as they go. Jesus then feeds 5,000 and more with one young boy's lunch. Peter declares his conviction that Jesus is the Christ, while Jesus predicts that the Son of Man must suffer. Those who wish to follow Jesus must take up their cross. Whoever desires to save his life must lose it. The Son of Man in his glory will be ashamed of whoever is ashamed of him. Luke then records the transfiguration of Jesus, accompanied by Moses and Elijah. Jesus does not object to someone casting out demons in his name, for whoever is not against us is for us. A Samaritan village does not receive Jesus but he rejects the disciples' call to destroy the place with fire, as Elijah had done. Having recently sent his twelve disciples out to teach and to heal, Jesus now expands his mission team when he appoints and sends out seventy disciples. 
They are to travel light, offering peace on a house, or having it returned to them. Those who reject the disciples reject Jesus. The seventy report back their successes, and Jesus says he sees Satan falling from heaven. Jesus prays, thanking the Father for revealing things to babes and concealing them from the wise. A lawyer asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. He cites the Shema and the injunction to love your neighbour, but then asks who his neighbour is. Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Within this parable we find the truth of loving like Jesus loved. We read that the law said to love God and to love people. The Samaritan portrayed this love, and Jesus told the young lawyer to go and love in the same way that Jesus loved. The Samaritan's love was displayed by compassion. At least two other men who had seen the poor stranger decided for their own reason not to help. It's worth noting that both were religious people. Love is not found in religion. We must put our religion aside, put our preferences aside, put our labels aside, and love those who are unlovely, which is loving like Jesus. The Samaritan's love was demonstrated by contact. Everyone except the Samaritan refused to touch the injured traveller. It was the Samaritan's willingness to get his hands dirty that demonstrated true love and compassion. It is in our being unafraid of being touched by the sins of others that allows us to minister to them in their darkest hours. And that is loving like Jesus loved. The Samaritan's love was delivered with care. We all have been wounded at one time or another and we need to apply the loving word of God to a wounded person. A child of God can, and does, sometimes go astray. The Samaritan paid for the man's stay, gave money for future stay, and promised to pay if the money did not cover all the expenses. When was the last time you gave up things that were intended for yourself, to give to someone who was wounded and dying? That would be loving like Jesus did. Jesus stays at the house of Martha and Mary. Martha busies herself with serving, whereas Mary simply sits uh, at his feet and listens to him. Martha is frustrated by her sister's inactivity, but Jesus says that she has made the right choice in sitting and listening. The disciples ask how to pray. So Jesus teaches them what is generally referred to as the Lord's Prayer. He then gives a brief parable on the need for persistence and determination in prayer. Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not trouble me, the door is shut, and I am in bed with my children. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give because he is your friend, yet because of your persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God encourages us to persist in bold and audacious prayer. God knows our sins and still wants us to come to him boldly and often. He wants to hear from us and is ready this minute to forgive and give us what we need. 
God will look for fruit like a farmer looks for fruit on a fruit tree. If the fruit is not forthcoming, the tree will be destroyed. We should be recognisable by our fruit. Jesus rebukes those who criticise him for healing a woman who is bent over on the Sabbath. We must strive to enter through the narrow gate to salvation, which will eventually be shut, causing wailing and gnashing of teeth. At a wedding feast, do not take the highest place on your own initiative. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted, and vice versa. Invite to dinner the poor who cannot repay you. These two ideas lead to a parable about a great feast. Those who were originally invited made excuses, so the poor and dispossessed were invited instead. Jesus then addressed a large crowd on the real cost of following him. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. No earthly love can be allowed to become an idol replacing God. Discipleship is open to those willing to bear their cross, focusing on self-sacrifice, not possessions. Jesus wants us to seriously consider the cost. Morally, discipleship includes a willingness to give things up. Symbolically, family resources and our own strength cannot complete the job. We must rely on heaven to help us. Those early disciples did literally abandon family and businesses to follow Jesus. We must be committed to Jesus above all material distractions. In chapter 15, Luke reports three parables about lost things, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. There is more rejoicing about the recovery of a lost sheep than there is about 99 who never went missing. The lost coin that is found is also a matter for rejoicing. The lost son is the story we generally know as the prodigal son, where the word prodigal just means wasteful. The son asks his dad for his inheritance, so he now has money and friends and can do whatever he wants. Initially, everything looks good. He's freed from the responsibility he had on the family farm. He's abandoned his duties. He doesn't need to set an alarm or live by a schedule. But this is a kind of counterfeit freedom. And all too soon the friends and the money are gone. He is degraded to such a position that no Jew would occupy. Not only feeding pigs but competing for what they eat. The prodigal still has one freedom he can use to his advantage, the freedom of choice. Such choice is God-given and no one can take it from us. We can always choose to go back home. The son could decide to go back to his father. The point of the parable is the father is waiting to receive the penitent back into his favour. Let's consider the blessings of exercising his freedom to return. It brought forgiveness, a warm acceptance and love as he's welcomed back into the family. Restoration in spite of the disgrace he's brought on the family name. Now he will know true freedom, freedom from want, Freedom from death, as the father says, this my son, who was dead, is now alive. God offers life to those who come to him through Christ. The father has work for us and a place in his household. There is real freedom 
in serving God. Jesus then tells the parable of the beggar Lazarus sitting at the gate of the rich man. Both of these men die. Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man to hell. The rich man asks Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool his tongue, but he is denied. The rich man wants to warn his brothers, but is told that they have Moses and the prophets for that purpose. Gratitude is a matter of attitude. It's the heart of giving thanks for the favour you received. As a Christian, every day ought to be a day of thanksgiving. Jesus encounters ten lepers who ask him to help them. He gave them instructions, and as soon as they obeyed, they were healed. Yet only one came back to express his gratitude to God. Leprosy was a horrible disease to have. Not only was there the pain of the disease itself, but there was also the stigma that went with having the disease. No intimacy with anyone. No friendship with anyone. You were isolated, a total outcast. According to Jewish tradition, they had to stand at least a hundred paces from anyone. They couldn't even come close to Jesus, and yet he healed them. But just one returned and glorified God. He came to Jesus and gave thanks. He realised the priority of both gratitude and worship. Jesus then told another parable, this one to state the correct attitude for prayer, an attitude which pleases God. He spoke of two men, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector, who both prayed. Pharisees were considered religious and widely respected. Tax collectors were universally despised. The Pharisee stood confidently in public, prayed out loud, and thank God that he was such a great bloke, w listing all the wonderful things he did. He clearly assumed that God would be impressed with his CV. The tax collector stood alone, couldn't even look up to heaven, and just confessed that he was a sinner, and begged God for mercy. Jesus said it was this man who God forgave, because the important difference was not in public perception, but in attitude of heart. The religious Pharisee asked for nothing, confessed nothing, and therefore received nothing. If you really want to do God's will, don't tell God how good you are. Tell others how good God is. Shortly after this, Jesus encounters a real-life tax collector, a very short man called Zacchaeus, who wanted to see Jesus. Jesus was walking around, but the crowd was too dense, so Zacchaeus climbed a tree to get a look. Jesus sees him and invites himself to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. Zacchaeus turns from his sin, and Jesus proclaims his salvation. Jesus knows it is time for him to complete all he came for and resolutely prepares to face his death. Jesus tells his disciples to fetch a donkey, which he rides on into Jerusalem. He is lauded by the people. He prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem and cleanses the temple. He tells the parable of the owner of the vineyard who sent his son to some very unruly tenants, and they kill him. Jesus cites Psalm 118 about the rejected stone becoming the cornerstone. The temple was to many Jews the Messiah, and in Jesus' eyes it was a false Messiah. He says, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Then Jesus warns them of other false messiahs. He advises them to be prepared, to be ready for the coming of the real messiah. 
and assures them that he will always be with them. Jesus is saying that God's timing is beginning, but not in an expected way, maybe through a way of suffering and upheaval. Nevertheless, God is in control. God is breaking in, maybe not the way we expect it, but it is happening. Jesus then assures his disciples and us that he will be with us, giving us the courage, the strength, the confidence to remain faithful to him in spite of all the hardship or suffering. Jesus then institutes the Last Supper. He says the bread speaks of his body broken. The wine speaks of the blood of the new covenant. Then Jesus predicts that woe shall befall his betrayer, Satan having already entered into Judas Iscariot. Jesus intervenes in a squabble about who is the most important disciple, saying the, that true greatness emerges, paradoxically, through service. He also predicts that Peter will deny him three times. Peter came, uh, Jesus came out of the upper room where he and his disciples had just eaten They walk, a very familiar walk, a walk they have walked many times, to a place across the Kidron Valley, a distance of about a mile, to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. There Jesus prays to his Father. He asks that the cup of suffering is taken from him, if at all possible but adds, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He's strengthened by an angel. Jesus rouses these sleeping disciples and instructs them to pray earnestly. Judas arrives with the authorities and betrays Jesus with a kiss. A disciple, unnamed here, but identified as Peter in John's Gospel, cuts off the right ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus heals the ear and gently submits to his arrest. Peter denies Jesus three times, and then the cock crows, reminding Peter that his Lord had said this would happen, although Peter had strenuously denied it. Jesus is blindfolded, beaten and mocked. Before the Sanhedrin, Jesus confirms that he is the Son of God. Jesus appears before Pontius Pilate to the governor of Judea. Pilate then sent him on to Herod Antipas, who, although generally referred to as King Herod, was never actually a king. He was the tetrarch or ruler of Galilee and Perea. Herod decided he was Pilate's problem, so he sent him back again. Herod and Pilate, who had previously had a bit of a power struggle, actually became friends through this exchange. Pilate offers the crowd to release a prisoner, either Jesus or a renowned convict called Barabbas. The crowd insists that Jesus is crucified and Barabbas is released. Pilate is reluctant, but acquiesces to the wish of the people, fearing for his own population. The Cyrenian Simon from modern-day Libya is made to carry Jesus' cross. Jesus tells the women of Jerusalem not to weep for him, but for themselves and for the calamities that are coming. Jesus is crucified between two criminals. Even as Jesus died, he was carrying out his mission statement and associating with sinners. Jesus looks at those who have crucified him and the crowd who come to observe and prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Onlookers mock him, 
an inscription reading, This is the King of the Jews, was written above his head. Jesus had his final conversation with a criminal and thug who was rethinking life in response to Jesus' character and mercy. This hardened criminal, hanging next to Jesus, sensed in him something so approachable that he was bold enough to ask Jesus to remember him in the kingdom. Jesus offered the man eternal life, saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. What Jesus was primarily trying to convey to the thief on the cross is the great mercy that God shows. Jesus has opened the door to the king's garden and the first person he invited to join him in paradise is a hardened criminal, a thief on the cross. Today, he said, you will be with me in paradise. There were no required courses, no special words, no waiting period. Just a statement of belief and the criminal received God's mercy through Jesus Christ. These words call us to be like the thief whose heart was moved by seeing the crucified Christ and to lift our voices in prayer with him. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus saw that this man was reaching toward him and he offered him paradise in return. There is then darkness across the earth and Jesus hands himself into his father's hands. As Jesus dies, the veil of the temple is torn in two and Jesus is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. On the Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Joanna and some other unnamed women went down to the tomb to put spices on the body. They found the entrance stone rolled away and the body of Jesus was gone. Then two men appeared in glistening clothes, said to the women, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be rose, raised again. The women went and told the eleven disciples, but they couldn't believe the message because it just seemed too incredible to them. Peter raced to the tomb to check, and he saw the empty tomb but still didn't really understand what had happened. Later that day there were two followers from Emmaus walking along a road, talking about everything that had happened. Jesus joined them but they were prevented from recognising him. Jesus asked them what they were talking about, and they told Jesus about his arrest, his trial, and his death. They said we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Just three words, but some of the very saddest words in the whole Bible. We had hoped. They speak of a future that is not to be, of a dream that didn't happen, a promise that proved to be false, and a future that is now closed off. We had hoped, the detective disciples tell Jesus. And that's the point, they don't hope anymore. But Jesus doesn't leave them. Instead, he said... Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then he explained to them what was in all the scriptures concerning himself. The entire Bible is about hope in the midst of despair. The entire Bible ultimately points to the resurrection, to the reconciled relationship between God and human beings, to a future when there seems there is none to love and light in a world of darkness and fear. 
we are told that when Jesus and the disciples got to Emmaus, Jesus kept going as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly. That's how it works. Jesus meets us where we are. He walks with us. He tells us the truth of his resurrection and then leaves it up to us as to whether we will invite him into our lives. Jesus then met with his disciples in an upper room. He showed them he wasn't a ghost or a figment of their imagination. He was truly alive among them. A saviour who had once for all conquered sin, Satan, death and hell. And it's on the basis of his authority they were sent out. And we also are sent out to live life on mission for Christ. He illuminated the understanding of scripture of the eleven, just as he had for the two on the Emmaus road. He revealed to them the necessity of the cross, how his coming to die for the sins of the world had been prophesied from the very beginning. It was the message the eleven needed. It is a message that we need, and we need over and over again. It's a message that we, like the eleven, need to take boldly to a desperately needy world. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're ever in the Radstock area one Sunday morning, why not come and join us for our 10.30 service at the Baptist Church? You will always be very welcome. <laughs>